Hi. We continue in Luke 17 today, picking up in verse 26, just as was in the days of Noah. But as we do, I want to note, as I was doing last time, when we looked at 22 to 25, that there's a nice little chiasm you can see on the screen now that connects what we looked at last time, starting in 24 all the way down to 30, with the lightning flashing um, matching the revealing of the human one, which to highlight that what we're talking about there is resurrection. But we'll get to that in a minute. So if you haven't watched the introductory video for this unit, 1711 and 1948, I strongly encourage you to do that. I'll go over briefly a couple of things we went over there, but there's much more detail there. So one of the key things that we're following the end of this chiasm and it extends all the way from 951 to 1948, and right now we're in this section here, and as I noted in the introduction, one of the faulty presuppositions that can prevent solid interpretations of this passage is that the passages should be read on their own rather than the partner with their chiastic parallel. And as I showed last time, one of the chiastic parallel elements between what we saw in that section of chapter 11, what we see in this section of chapter 17, is the implicit confrontation between Satan kingdom and God's kingdom, but the all, but more explicit, the bringing up of Hebrew Bible people who called for repentance or faced God's judgment and uh, were saved. So Jonah in the context of Nineveh and Noah in the context of the flood, of course, and Lot in the context of Sodom. And as we'll see, not a chiastic partner, but there's one more that's like a little Easter egg, as we might say in, in movies or games these days, another little reference to the Hebrew Bible hidden in plain sight in our section. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, as we've been noting in this unit, the theme that connects all these passages is the element of rejection, other than the little couple of verses about when or where the reign of God would be. And as you can see on the right side, all these elements of rejection along the way. And our immediate scene, uh, one of the questions is, is the time that's being referred to here as this time of suffering, etc., and the days of the human one, referring to the passion and resurrection of Jesus or the destruction of Jerusalem a generation later. And as I was suggesting in the last video, it's almost certain that this, this passage we're looking at today on the left column of the right side of the screen is about Jesus' passion and resurrection, and the one in chapter 21, both with apocalyptic imagery that, that is parallel in some places, as you can see by the color coding, is referring to a later time, because there it's the focus around what will happen to disciples over the long haul. They will arrest you and persecute you, hand you over to synagogues and prisons. Obviously, the plural of it isn't just referring to events in Jerusalem, but what we see in Acts of the Apostles being spread out there uh, across the story. So um, right now, we're going to be focusing on how this plays out into the passion and resurrection, which is the point of the chiasm, this larger chiasm of the journey to Jerusalem is pointing to around the lack of Jerusalem's um, understanding the time of its visitation, as we've seen already and as we'll see some more. I also noted briefly last time that there are certainly parallels in language here, what Luke has and what Matthew has in chapter 24, but each of them, regardless of how they originally got it from each other or from so-called Q, this, the scholarly way of referring to what's in common with Luke and Matthew, Matthew, they're using them in very different ways. And the passage in Matthew 24 is parallel, not so much to what we see here, even though it uses some of the same language, but to chapter 21 in Luke, as it's also parallel to Mark 13. So when we get to chapter 21, we'll look at that more. And then finally, as we prepare for our immediate scene, I was noting there weren't a key, there wasn't a keyword uh, page for the entire chapter 17 because there aren't really keywords that go through the whole chapter. But I noted in the uh, first part of it, this question of look here, look there, that connected the Pharisees' question about the kingdom to the beginning of our immediate scene. But now I've, I've laid out what we're going to look at today this way. And actually, between the video, the last video and this video, I've reposted uh, this chart on RadicalBible.net three different times because I keep adding more things to it and changing it, including setting it out in this semi-poetic parallel and also making the connection that although the English normally has lose here, secure their life will lose it, and those who lose it will keep it, it's the same word as in these two places around Noah and around Lot. So plainly, that's the contrast that's, that's being made there, and we'll have to see exactly what's going on. I also highlighted and just underlined, colored, um, without bold here, these phrases that come as a refrain. They're not identical exactly, but they start with eating and drinking the ordinary things of life, and then here at the bottom, the pair with one will be taken and one will be left. Um, so I'm going to leave that up as it guides us through the, the passage we're looking at today. 
So you saw the chiasm, and as I noted last time, uh, the issue of the lightning flashing is certainly a resurrection reference in, in connection with what we see in chapter 25, or I'm sorry, in verse 25, around the semi-passion portent. Semi in the sense it doesn't specify that it's going to be the Sanhedrin or rejected by particular people, just suffering in general and general rejection, which I think is really important because it's not just about the fact that the Jerusalem elite, the Sanhedrin, or the Roman officials will reject Jesus, but he'll be rejected by the entire generation. And I've been noting in this unit, especially in the introduction, that symbolizes by the story of the lepers where nine um, who are um, cleansed of their leprosy do not come back and thank Jesus because they don't have the eyes to see that not only they've been cleansed but they've been healed. So there are 90% of the people don't follow and only one does and that's um, paradigmatic for what we're going to see that no matter what class of society the elite or the ordinary or the poor um, Jesus will largely be rejected by this generation. Uh, so we saw that because it says first he must endure, that what's suggesting is the lightning is flashing for the human one in his day is what follows, which is to say resurrection. And jumping ahead to verse 30 so we can see the other side of the chiasm before we look in the details, um, that's where a chiasm really helps us because it says it will be like that on the day the Son of Man is revealed, using apocalyptai here, um, which is the uh, verb form for a um, apocalypse, as I referred to last time, and highlighting that what's being revealed is is the lightning, like lightning flashing from the sky. And note, as I said last time, it's not that the human will be lightning, it's a comparison for as lightning, so will the human one be in his day, which is to say uh, that, uh, that with resurrection, Jesus is no longer limited to a particular place. And I mentioned that last time, and of course we'll get to that more when we get to the resurrection stories in chapter 24, where Two of them, two of the disciples can encounter Jesus on the road to Emmaus, the risen Jesus, and at the same time others in Jerusalem um, have also encountered him. So he'll, like lightning, he will fill the space. So uh, with that in mind, let's jump right into our passage. Uh, and as we do, we note that the parallels obviously between Lot and Noah are the two primordial um, destructions in Genesis, one by water and one by fire. Um, and Lot and Noah are similar characters in a way, and that neither of them are model characters. The narrator of Genesis 6 says Noah was blameless in his generation, and even the early rabbinic Midrash said in a, a generation of corrupt people, Noah was the best that God could get. And certainly Noah's behavior doesn't portray him as any kind of a saint. He just silently does what God says, and he's obedient in that sense, but it doesn't seem to have any concern for the destruction of all the people around him, unless you watch the uh, Russell Crowe version in the film Noah, where that's filled out a little bit. And similarly, Lot, um, who is a, a weak comparison with his uncle Abraham in terms of the hospitality of the visitors, uh, and he offers up horribly his daughters to them, and when that doesn't work, uh, he runs away in fear. Uh, so neither Noah or Lot are model characters, but they do escape um, the judgment and uh, come out alive. And so that's what's being noted here. Not that people have to be saints or holy people, but they have to at least be awake and aware of what's going on amidst ordinary things. So let's look a little more closely at the language of, that sets up this theme. So, so too in the days of the human one. And I won't go over again why I refer to what's translated here as son of man as human when I did that last time and I've been doing it throughout. Um, but the reference is from Daniel 7.13. So they were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in, in marriage. Um, and my note below has contrasting the ordinary activities of the Noah people and those of the Lot people with eating and drinking in common, as we see right here. Uh, and there's, I don't think there's anything special about the particular things that are named, although marrying and being given in marriage are actually rare words. We saw in the question of the wedding banquet back in 1420 and the um, master coming home from a wedding in 1618. We see it here and then we'll see the question of uh, a marriage here around the Leverite thing where Jesus is challenged by the Sadducees around that. Um, but to the extent that the marrying issue was a part of the, um, the issue in the flood, uh, it's not really. It's more of an issue in the Sodom story where Lot's daughters uh, have sons-in-law or prospective sons-in-law. So it's, it's just to say the ordinary things. Until the day Noah entered the ark. 
and the flood came and destroyed all of them. So as we've been noting in the contrast between days and day, and so we saw in the days of Noah, but then until the day Noah entered the ark. And so what we looked at last time was one scholar noting that the plural days re refers generally to a set of events that are surrounding something that echoes God's judgment as opposed to one specific day. So there obviously is one specific day in the Genesis narrative where Noah enters the ark, just like there's a particular day that Lot left Sodom and it rained fire and sulfur. But the days of Lot are include all the time that he's there um, and the messengers of God are there and um, the preparation for the destruction is there and only Lot seems to be aware of it and even his prospective sons-in-law think he's joking with them as the text says. Uh, so the flood came, the cataclysmos, only here in Luke and it's parallel in Matthew and also one other time in Second Peter. So the word cataclysmos in Greek, a from which, of course, we get the English word cataclysm, um, is what literally is a flood, and Luke only has it here. It's only used in the New Testament to refer to the primordial flood. Uh, and then it shifts gears a little bit, and as Marshall notes, no mention of the sins of Sodom. It's as though it's, it is the thought of unpreparedness and attachment to earthly pursuits rather than of sin, which is uppermost. And like more other recent scholars, I, I think the uh, dichotomy between earthly pursuits rather than sin is um, a, more of a Christian reading than uh, in the sense of a platonic reading of separating earthly pursuits uh, separate from sin. But I think what's at issue here is just the ordinariness, um, and that's what more recent scholars have said. They're just engaging in the everyday business of life. Um, and likewise here, hom homoios um, is several times as a link. So we saw that, see that here, three times as this link. So they were eating and drinking um, and buying and selling, and we've seen buying a couple times in Luke, although it's never positive. In 9.13, it's when the disciples ask where they're going to buy food to feed the crowd in the wilderness, and Jesus says, feed them yourselves. And um, this is uh, a reference to the excuse of the wedding. I've just bought some land, and we have this here, and there's another one there. But buying and, and money are not generally positive in Luke, but the judgment against the economy is not what's at issue here. It's just talking about ordinary stuff. Um, buying and selling, planting and building. Um, the connection of planting and building, though, is a particular Hebrew scripture expression for establishing life. And I can just show you one example here from Joshua, near the very end of Joshua. So I give you a land in which you had not labored, and towns that you had not built, and you live on them. You eat the fruit of the vineyards and olive yards that you did not plant. So the building and the planting, highlighting the basic elements of security, of having a place to live and the food um, to eat there. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed them all. Notice it's not saying exactly that God did these things in both the Lot and the Noah situation. God is not mentioned. It's simply as if these are separate elements that just happen almost by themselves. The flood came and it rained fire and sulfur. But it's not mentioned that God is doing it, as the Genesis story certainly make clear. Um, nor is it, as Marshall notes, at least at one level, I agree, that there's anything about sin here. It's simply about being aware and prepared for what's going on. And then the chiasm closes, it will be like that on the day the human one is revealed. And I've already noted that parallel. So let's go down, let's scroll down a little bit so we can see the rest of our, our passage here. Um, and notice that after this uh, Hebrew Bible parallel from Genesis, uh, it switches to giving advice to the immediate audience. So the first part in the chiasm was a recollection of what has happened in the past of the audience, and now it's the, the warning to what they should do. Um, and as Lang notes in his article on this uh, unit, is very helpful, how many scholars see verses 31 to 34 as out of place or otherwise off topic because they wrongly assume the passage is about the parousia rather than the passion. Uh, and that's one of those many points, as I was saying, around the faulty presuppositions here, that this is referring to the parousia rather than the passion. And, and when you start with the wrong presupposition, and then you engage in redaction or editorial criticism to separate out what you think is really from Jesus or what you think is from Luke or something else, then you compound your error by suggesting these verses shouldn't be there, rather than questioning your own presupposition that leads you to feel like these verses don't fit. And so my own method, which I indicate in the uh, original videos that started this Radical Bible series, and I want to encourage anybody watching to practice, is that if our presuppositions seem to make the story not work, then maybe we need to challenge our presuppositions rather than that the story fit our presuppositions. Um, so let's see how this fits. 
So on that day uh, that he's revealed, which whether that's literally the day of his death or the day of resurrection, it seems resurrection because that's the issue of lightning there. So on the Easter day, so to speak, anyone on the housetop who has belongings in the house must not come down to take them away. And likewise, any in the field must, um, must not turn back. Um, and um, why the housetop and why the field? Um, well, we can have those couple of examples. There's uh, one more down here in the omitted verse 36 about people in, in a situation where two are there and one is taken and one is left. But it's just to highlight ordinary things. Uh, we might not normally be on our housetops, but, but housetops in this context would be like a patio and a place you could look out um, and eat meals, etc., and um, have a little space from the street below or um, from the uh, claustrophobic element of a small interior. Um, so we're not normally on our roofs, but if you can imagine the, the coaster singing up on the roof, uh, you might get the image there. So likewise, anyone in the field must not turn back, um, which immediately brings up Lot's wife. Um, as you can see there, Lot's wife, who turns into a pillar of salt for looking back. And I would suggest that turning back here, like with Lot's wife, is a symbolic, not just of literally turning back, as if you don't have time to turn back or you'll get caught, but to not look back at the old way of life. That with the death and resurrection of Jesus, there's a new dispensation, just like there was with the destruction of Sodom. And Lot's wife is looking back to the old way and, and implicitly lamenting the destruction, and that's her doom. So remember here, curiously, uh, only here in Luke, we'll see Acts and Acts a couple of times, 21 times in the New Testament, but, but only here to remember Lot's wife. And it's expecting you remember it, it doesn't tell you uh, what the detail is. And then we have a very interesting verse, and here's where at the beginning I was suggesting the little Easter egg here is. So New RSV has those who try to make their life secure will lose it, and those who lose their life will keep it. It's echoing, but with different language, what we saw in 924 here. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. Uh, and Marshall notes it's remarkable that Luke should have used the same saying from Mark twice since he never does so anywhere else and has an aversion to doublets. And my no own note says, really? Uh, we have a hand up that shows 20 of them. But that's not even the point. It's not a doublet. This is very different than the verse in 924. And a couple of the key words reveal that. And that's what I'd like to point out here. So those who try to make their life as pasuke, which is translated correctly here and sometimes wrongly as soul. It's plainly not about saving your soul, but saving your being, your essence, your pasuke. But the word for secure here, um, peri poiosate, literally meaning to, to make around, uh, has to do with saving life. And one of the interesting things is that word, along with the word for keeping life here, zoagoneo, are used in this little passage in Exodus 1.16 about Pharaoh and the midwives. Um, so in addition to the warning about Noah and the flood and uh, Lot and Sodom, implicitly in the story is a bigger picture of the Passover story. And there's one more piece of that that makes clear that these verses that some scholars think are out of place fit here perfectly and highlight the, the deeper theme beyond the flood and Sodom is the central story of the Hebrew Bible of the Passover. And so let's see how that plays out here. So those who try to make their life secure, and as Joel Green notes, the word is often used in commercial context to acquire for itself, but that's not our point here. Um, we'll lose it or we'll destroy it, which is how I rendered it here because it was destroyed up here. And those who destroy their life will keep it. And that is to say, obviously not literally your bios um, to destroy your life, but your, um, and notice that this word is not the same as pasuke here. This is zoagonio here, um, whereas it's the same word he here in both places. And in the Exodus, um, which is to say it's used once, to keep your life is used once here, to keep it alive for yourself. But it's used three times in these little, in the little six verse Exodus passage from 117 to, to 22 about keeping the life of the, the baby girls. And so what's at issue there um, is how we interpret what follows here. Um, and as uh, Vincent notes from um, his position in Alabama, I'll read his quote here, and you can see that, but then we'll get to a deeper one. He says, verses 34 and 35 are not about the rapture, since there is no such thing taught by the New Testament. 
but I must admit that I don't believe I've ever convinced a Schofield toting LaHaye quoting full-fledged premillennial dispensationalist to see things my way. You may want to pick an easier argument like how to settle the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is darkly ironic given he was writing that many years ago, and while I'm making this video, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very tense indeed. He goes on to say, I must also admit that I have never been able to convince a board quoting latte sipping liberal mainliner, and if you don't know who he's referring to, don't worry about it, I hope you get the idea, that he or she ought to believe in the second coming just because it is so fundamental to New Testament theology. They tend to say things like, yeah, but you're from Alabama, right? And there's a certain point there um, that whether you're a liberal or conservative, people can be caught in their presuppositions. But as more recent scholars, including Lang and Jusa, whose work I used on the last video highlight, this is plainly not about the parousia or about the second coming. It's about Jesus' passion and what you should do in the judgment that that faces. And the judgment in this case is as much Rome's as it is God's. So let's see how that plays out in verses 34 to 35. On that night, which is plainly connecting both with the Last Supper and um, the Passover, as we see from Exodus 12, 8 and 12, which we can go back and see there. They shall eat the, the lamb, the Passover lamb. And in 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. Um, but as I'm sure most of us know, if you read to continue, but I will pass over you. And that, I'd suggest, is the point here, that on that night there are two in one bed, or it could be at one table, clean A, could as well be a dinner table, the two in one bed doesn't make as much sense as the ordinary sense, connecting with eating and drinking, there are two at one table. One will be taken and one will be left. So, um, as my note below says, under the usual wrong Perusia interpretation, those taken are the saved. But as Merkel shows, based on the prophetic tradition, those taken are the condemned. And we see that in Jeremiah and Isaiah uh, several times. But that's, of course, exactly what's happening in the Exodus story. Um, and when I made my note here, I hadn't made the connections with 117 to 22 that I just showed you. But there they are. So here the one that's taken is to say the one that will die in the Exodus parallel, or in, I'd like to suggest arrested and taken by the Romans and the other left behind. Um, and so uh, that's what's at issue here, is that you need to get out of the way so that when Jesus is arrested, you won't face, you won't be in Peter's situation and go, I don't know him, um, uh, and caught being one of those people. And so two women grinding meal together, suggesting the dinner preparation, one will be taken, the other left. And verse 36, which is in some manuscripts matching Matthew as a field, is not in most, so we leave it out there. And then finally the disciples speak. And the translation in ORSV is wrong, 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 and most other translations and scholars note that. Corp, the word for corpse is simply soma, which just means body. And maybe it's the corpse, but body is the right word. It doesn't necessarily imply that. And vultures is wrong, too at many levels. Um, as Fitzmaier noted decades ago, um, eagle, not a vulture, the distinction was known at the time of the gospel. And the lexicon notes that Aristotle classes vultures among eagles. But the Lolita, Lonita lexicon notes that only in the Western Hemisphere there are two distinct families of birds. Birds of prey, which feed upon dead bodies as eagles, and vultures, which never take live prey, but only feed upon carcasses. Highlighting that it's one class of birds uh, for both in the context here. But plainly it's referring to eagles as the Roman soldiers, whether around the dead body of the temple, as my note suggests symbolically, which would be referring to the time in the year 70, or in what I'm coming to believe now, the immediate body of Jesus on the cross, where, they, where the Roman soldiers will gather around the cross, leaving the question of the destruction of Jerusalem for the next time. So this is all part of what we're seeing of preparing the disciples for Jesus' rejection and for their own rejection and for what they should do when that happens so they don't get caught like deer in the headlights or like Peter uh, refusing to acknowledge that they're in relation to the human one. And we'll pick it up next time with the parable that follows very importantly after that because the disciples hearing this must be terrified about the need to pray always and not lose heart. See you for that next time. Bye-bye.